Welcome, everybody, to Please Don't Punch the GM Adventures in Gaming Therapy. My name is Adam Davis. Uh, my name is Adam Johns. That's right. We're both named Adam. Um, <laughs> hello. Uh, we founded Wheelhouse Workshop to help teenagers build social skills using role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons. And we founded Wheelhouse Workshop in the Seattle area. We both live in Seattle now, although I'm from San Antonio, so it's really exciting to be back for PAX. Um, <laughs> Ghost bars. <laughs> um, I have a, a master's degree in education with a specialization in drama therapy, and I am a school teacher in the Seattle Public Schools. I have a master's degree in couple and family therapy, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in the Seattle area, specializing in seeing geeks and gamers in therapy. But before we did any of that, we were gamers. We were gamers since we were little kids. We started playing role-playing games. How old were you, Adam? Like eight or nine. I think I was something like ten. And when we met in grad school, we realized something, and that was that these games that we had loved for all those years were good for us. That no matter what reason why we chose to play those games, they had all these benefits that we used to make, uh, make our lives better. Um, and that's why we founded Wheelhouse Workshop, because we wanted to help these teenagers by intentionally focusing on all those reciprocal skills you get by playing role-playing games, by creating in-game scenarios that are targeted to their real-world areas of social growth. So you, you guys love these games, and when I say these games, especially in the context of this talk, what I'm talking about is role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games. Uh, we play primarily Dungeons and Dragons in our groups, but uh, fifth edition with a lot of homebrew rules and a lot of adjustments to it. But I, really when I say that, I'm covering like all the bases for, for all of that. Um, but everybody comes to the table. They come to it for different reasons. There's a lot of different reasons. And that's actually one of the things that makes these games, makes tabletop role-playing games so unique and so wonderful is that it has a lot to offer to people. There's a lot of reasons that make it fun, that make it a good reason to, to show up and keep showing up week after week or month after month. So raise your hand if this is true for you. If you love the thrill of fighting in role-playing games. Uh, that feeling of dealing the final blow to the necromancer after he wiped out half of your team. Yeah. <laughs> or people who love the strategy and the, the tactics. I want to sneak around uh, from behind and get the plus two bonus for flanking, and then since I'm attacking from stealth, I get the advantage on the attack roll. Did anybody notice that he mixed up the rules from 3.5 and 5th edition? Yes. <laughs> You're my people. <laughs> um, or the people who love the, the uh, acquiring new skills and abilities, looking forward to leveling up. Um, when my monk... When my monk is level 20, he's going to be super powerful, especially with his four levels of rogue to help supplement. You're level three. Yeah, but, but in time, in time he'll get there and it's going to be awesome. Or the, the people who love creating new characters all over and over again with this almost infinite palette. Yeah. Um, my wizard starts off in wizard school, but he only stays there for a little while because then a cult takes out his school and he has to pick up the sword and heavy armor in order to help defend himself because his spells aren't powerful enough. You can't cast an armor. Well, I'm going to take two levels of wizard and then four levels of fighter, and I'll take the feet so that I can cast in heavy armor um, to help, help, help do that. Uh, then there are the beer and pretzels people, people who like the game for the social interaction. They like to just hang out with their friends, witty banter, inside jokes, or maybe even the characters that the, the GM makes up. Oh, welcome to my haberdashery. What can I help you with? Uh, well, I'd like a hat. A hat? Well, that is what we specialize in. Largely purple hats, but uh, we do have a nice selection of green this time of year. Well, I'll take a green hat. A green hat? Very well. That'll be 100 billion gold. I'll take a purple one. Well, that, that'll be 10 gold. I'll do it. Um, and then there are also the people who like the game for the story. Yes. Yeah, I like it. Uh, as you strike the final blow to the henchman of the, of the uh, uh, goblin king, you, he falls to his knees and you walk up and you grab him by the cuff of his collar and you pick him up and you look at him in eye level and you stare him down and you reach up and you rip his mask off as you realize it was old man McGillicuddy the whole time. And I would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for you meddling kids. The chances are really good that if you like these games, you like them for probably a big combination of those reasons. And maybe there's one that draws you to the game, but but it's the combination, it's the, the variance in all of that that really keeps you coming back again and again. But what we're interested in is what you take away from the table. So whatever the reasons that bring you to it, there's a lot of stuff that this, these games, that tabletop role-playing games, give you just naturally, just by 
sitting down and playing the game, you take away a lot of benefits. We actually tried to make a list of all of the reasons why RPGs were good for you at, at our office, and we filled a whiteboard from beginning to end, top to bottom, uh, with all the different reasons why RPGs are good for you. So when we were coming to this panel, we had to figure out what we were going to talk about, and just listing all the reasons might not be that entertaining. So we narrowed it down to four. Um, so th these four are... They're the, maybe the four big ones, the four ones that you can expect to take away from just about any table you sit down with um, and to benefit from in that way. But they're also the four biggest things that we tend to focus on in our social skills groups, the things that we put a lot of emphasis and intentionality into helping to do. And those are perspective taking, frustration tolerance, creative problem solving, and cooperation. And perspective taking is this the act of imagining what the world looks like through someone else's eyes. And it's built into all role-playing games, and it's one of our primary focuses because it's the core seed of empathy, which is something we're really working on as a society, not just for young people. And it's built in to every role-playing game because in every role-playing game, you're playing a character, and that character has a different set of uh, ideals and beliefs than you do. Um, all perspective taking is kind of based on theory of mind. Are there any like Psych 101, former or present Psych 101 students out there? Um, theory of mind is the idea that I understand that other people know different things than what I know. And what's kind of interesting about theory of mind is a, a common concept in psychology is that um, we're not born with theory of mind. We're actually, we actually develop it at a really early age. So um, there's a series of studies um, that are usually called the unexpected contents tests. And these have been around for a long time. They kind of help reveal the idea behind theory of mind. And three-year-olds, when they, they tend to fail this test, and the way the test works is basically like this. The researcher walks up, and he's holding a box of candy or something like that, shows it to the three-year-old and says, uh, what do you think is in this? And the three-year-old will say, candy. And then the researcher will open the box and reveal that there are actually colored pencils inside. And the three-year-old will be excited because it's something different than what they expected. And this researcher will close the box again and then turn and say, now what does your friend think is in this box? If I ask them the same question, what will they say? And the three-year-old will respond, colored pencils. Because the three-year-old doesn't yet have the idea that that person that's next to them has a different set of knowledge than their own set of knowledge. They assume everybody knows exactly the things that they know. Now, if you ask a seven-year-old the same thing, a seven-year-old will pass it with flying colors. They know the difference. They know that that other person's also going to be, be tricked by this lure of candy that the researcher is trying to give them. Um, so they, they know how to watch out for that. Um, and that's a simple example. but. Honestly, we work on this as adults. We work on this for most of our lives. We're constantly trying to develop the idea of theory of mind, of understanding other people have different knowledge than we have, especially when we're driving in traffic in our 30s. And, <laughs> and that guy just cut me off, and I have to make it to a panel at this convention. <laughs> um, and we still have to practice the idea that like, they don't know that I am more important than them in this particular situation. <laughs> And that, that's an important piece because understanding that we're still developing those things is a big part of what we put into our groups. It's a big part of what we understand about the teens that come into our groups. We consider the teens in our wheelhouse workshop groups as having what we say lagging social skills or underdeveloped social skills. Um, and that means that they need extra experience in being able to develop those social skills, develop the ability, uh, that ability to relate to others in that way. Um, and perspective taking, especially, is a huge focus in our games because it promotes the idea of being able to understand the people that you game with, the people that are at the table around you. And we do this intentionally by giving one player character information that he has to tell to the rest of the party members, or by having the players play their characters as if they don't know the things that the player knows. Um, an example of this is we, were, we had a, a campaign where they were battling against shape-shifting monsters from beyond time and space. And it was straight out of They Live, if anybody's ever seen that movie. Um, and these shape-shifting monsters had infiltrated the, the realm and were disguising themselves as normal people. And the only way to determine if a character played by the game master was actually a shape-shifting monster was by looking through this monocle that they'd gotten from the evil Dr. Ventrani. So they, they called this the Ventrani lens. And we gave this to a player who was struggling with engagement, who uh, would occasionally zone out or occasionally um, lose interest in the game. So in giving him this, we gave him an opportunity to be essential and for the rest of the teammates to really rely on him. And so whenever they interacted with a non-player character, 
they would always have to, in character, remind him to use his Ventrani lens to see if it was actually a shape-shifting monster from beyond time and space. And then he would look through the lens, and then the game master would say, oh yeah, it's got the tentacle things, and it's a, it's a monster. And the other players, even though they knew that it was a shape-shifting monster from beyond time and space, they had to wait for him to, in character, give them the signal that it was, in fact, a shape-shifting monster. <laughs> and this, this worked most of the time. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it could get a little frustrating. <laughs> well, which is actually um, got, brings us right into frustration tolerance. So um, frustration, as you guys know, is kind of a, a part of this game. It's kind of built into the game, actually. Yeah, there's a 5% chance on every 20-sided die roll you're going to get a critical fail. Uh, so we actually, uh, to reveal a little bit to you, we actually take it a step further, and we often create purposeful situations in the game to be extra frustrating for our players. Um, you know, like every good DM does. Um, and failure, I mean, the, the reason for that is that failure and understanding that some challenges require a lot of extra effort, they require a lot of extra times of, of approaching it, is a super important piece to developing skills, but is also an important piece of the game. The trick is an understanding that there is opportunity and even enjoyment in fumbles. There's an enjoyment to the game even when you're missing, even when you're, you're rolling a rolling a one on your, on your spot check. Um, frustration tolerance is about the idea that you're developing skills to be able to handle that frustration. That when I roll a one, I don't table flip. Um, it is the ability to create skills for that. And one of the best skills for that is positive reframe, where you take a failed role or, or a failed situation or a, a thing you didn't do so well, and you find the inherent fun and good stuff in that bad situation. In our tables, there's no such thing as really a bad roll. There's actually a, a joke at the table on my Tuesday night group where they say a, a one is awesome and a two is actually the worst roll because of the stuff we come up with whenever there's a critical fail. And um, uh, as an example, uh, we, we always try to turn turn critical fails into something crazy, hilarious, or some, some other thing. And uh, there was one situation where we're going through a dungeon and they went into the next room and I described this gigantic monstrous spider was slowly descending from the ceiling with acid dripping from its jaws and its mandibles clicking. And I had him roll a save against fear and one of the players critically failed. And I could have had her suffer a penalty to her dice rolls or get disadvantage. And instead I wanted to turn it into an opportunity for some team building and a little bit of collaboration. So I had her, she was playing a gnome, and I had this gnome jump up and scream at the top of her lungs and jump on the back of the fighter and hang on for dear life. And then instead of turning this just into a simple bad situation, the party had to shift their energy and then end up talking the gnome down and <laughs> helping her calm down. And they went through, you know, tr try deep breathing. Um, try thinking about something that's not a giant spider. <laughs> and, and it provided us an, an opportunity to turn this, this like what would have been a, a terrible role into an opportunity for us to do a little creative problem solving and also have a discussion about what helps us calm down. Um, that actually is um, really great for transitioning into creative problem solving. So uh, whenever you have to jump in and adjust to a surprise thing that's suddenly come up, um, creative problem solving skills are the thing that kind of help you carry through that. Um, and that's also, I'm sure you guys have realized, um, no matter how hard you try to railroad your players, they will create a problem solve all over the place. <laughs> so we tend to promote it. We want to we wanna encourage a lot of creative problem solving. Um, and because of that, we often are creating challenges that are open-ended, that have multiple solutions, that have multiple ways to solve them, which is slightly different than a, a riddle or a puzzle where it has a, a specific way to solve it. Because when you have a, an open-ended challenge or an open-ended uh, puzzle in front of you, you have the opportunity to um, create, to creatively use your equipment, your skills, your teammates even, uh, to help solve that problem. So creative so problem solving essentially uses flexibility, it, it builds resilience, it uses frustration tolerance, it uses a lot of frustration tolerance. Um, it's putting a problem in front of somebody and saying, here's the problem, here's this thing in front of you, what do you do now? So we actually, when we intentionally create problem solving situations, what we do is what we, is what we call a lateral thinking puzzle. And I'll walk you through how all this works. Um, we have a very common puzzle that we like to give our players very early on. We call it the lever puzzle. And the lever puzzle uh, essentially goes like this. You walk into a room, and the door slams behind you. 
and you see around you that it's a, a kind of square looking room. There's not a whole lot in it. There's dust on the walls. You can see mold growing. Uh, clearly nobody's been in this room for a long time. And across the way, you see a wooden door and there's a portcullis blocking the door, bars blocking the door. Um, and the only thing in the room is a big giant lever in the I middle pull the of lever. the floor. That's pretty much what every player does first. As you pull the lever, you hear gears clunking under the ground beneath you. You hear gears churning and, and things coming to life, machinery coming to life within the walls as you, as you hear everything clunking and chunking together. Um, and then you see as spikes lower down from the ceiling and the ceiling starts slowly lowering towards you. That is where the prescribed part of this puzzle ends. Everything else from this puzzle I have not planned out. There's no particular solution. There's no particular way to get out of this room to stop yourself from being impaled by a ceiling full of spikes. Um, everything else from here on in is just the creativity of the players. It's whatever they can creatively come up with to help solve this puzzle. And we've had all sorts of different solutions. Everything from uh, wizards who want to cast detect magic and then find the, the me magical slash mechanical gearing that's in the walls and then break open the, the walls and rip the gearing out to uh, people flying up near the spikes and then trying to jam stuff into the, into the ceiling to help stop it. Um, my favorite, one of my favorites was a cleric who picked up the dwarf barbarian and then rammed him into the, into the door. With, with his permission, she, she had his permission. Um, <laughs> Until, until they could break through, um, which, which actually worked really well. You, you have a few good stories from that. Uh, yeah, I actually ran this on, on Tuesday. And because this lever room was, was a secret door off of a supply closet or something, and they were searching for the secret door, and he critical failed, so we found a box of pineapples. And he decided to add these pineapples to his inventory. And then those became the way to solve the lever puzzle. Um, because they found behind a secret compartment the gears, and they just started throwing the pineapples into the gears. <laughs> and the pineapples gummed up the gears and stopped the spikes. It was brilliant. <laughs> um, or there was another time I, I had a, a player that I actually had never played the game before. So I was so proud of him when he discovered this, uh, or he came up with this solution. And he uh, was playing a wizard and he wanted to cast the spell Dimension Door. And for those of you that don't know Dimension Door, it's kind of like a teleport. You choose a spot within a certain distance, so he just could choose a spot on the other side of the door to basically teleport to. But the thing about Dimension Door is if you accidentally teleport into something, into a physical object, you'll be shunted, which, is, which means you're randomly placed somewhere within 100 feet or something like that. And um, in order to prevent that, because if he was shunted back into this room, they would all be in the same terrible situation they were already in, um, he convinced his teammates to wait until the exact last moment. So he described them all holding each other by the shoulders and, and slowly crouching as the spikes descended <laughs> and then cast a mention door. So he, he got everybody into the next room and he was in fact shunted. So he was randomly placed in that room because the spikes were just right there above his head. So proud of him for that. <laughs> And actually, usually the best solutions, the ones that we're most proud of, but also the ones that I find the most amazing, are the ones that involve teamwork. The ones that involve great cooperation between characters relying on someone else's skills or someone else's magical ability in order to help achieve and, and come out of the other end of it. Um, which brings us to cooperation. Uh, cooperation is one of those life skills that is so important because we need other people all the time. Two is better than one. The game is inherently team-based, although I'm sure that there's some guys in the back who are clearly aggressive enough that they would disagree with me. But it's a cooperative game. Uh, it is a game where you are supposed to be working together. You are an adventuring party. You are um, working together to help get to a common goal, all, all as one group. But we want to take it one step farther than that. We, we don't want to settle for cooperation, so we try to make our game collaborative. And collaboration being not just two is better than one, but that if we all play our roles just right, and if we all do what's ours to do, we're actually more than the sum of our parts. So we do a lot of world building in our games to really set the collaborative tone at the very beginning of the game, where we, whenever we enter into a new city, I take my DM screen and I fold it down, which is my signal that we're world building, and we create the name of the city with a little whiteboard that I have, and we create the city one letter at a time, so sometimes it ends up this horrible cluster of consonants, <laughs> renting into crazy busy. <laughs> and then uh, we go around and we'll all say something we know about the city, oh, it's floating above the, above the ocean, it's got um, people made of rock, all the kinds of crazy things we'll come up with before we enter into the city, and then we kind of improvise, and then I put the DM screen back up, and that signals that I'm back in my role. Um, 
And it's fundamental to the way that people play at Wheelhouse Workshop Groups. You should tell the Be a Gothma story. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, once the same party that jumped on the back and was screaming earlier with the spider, and they're going through the same dungeon, and they were about to go into another door. And uh, I paused the game, and I put down the DM screen, and I had them think back to their character's childhood. And a, a, they had all heard a cautionary tale about a horrible, monstrous troll. And so we created the name of the troll and came up with the name Bia Goffma. It's awesome. And then we, I had the, the players each go around the circle and say something that their character had heard when they were a child about Bia Goffma. And because these tales all take different forms in all the different towns that they were from, even Crystal Prisic, um, the, they could come up with anything. So um, one person said, well, I heard Bia Goffma snatches children out of their bed when they're asleep. Well, I heard Bia Goffma punishes uh, kids who lie by eating them. And somebody else said, oh, my uncle makes us go into the woods and leave offerings to Bia Goffma or else he'll punish our village. So we did all this great creative backstory for Bia Goffma, and then I lifted my GM screen back up, which signaled that I was back in control. And then when they entered into the next room, the light was dark. And as their eyes slowly adjusted, they heard a voice come from the darkness. Hello, look who's come to play with Bia Goffma. <laughs> and that was like six months ago. <laughs> and they still talk about Bia Goffma. They still ask me to do the voice. <laughs> I, love, I love the Bia Goffma voice. Um, that's actually the, the way that you take story away is maybe one of the most important things. And it's not one of the skills we listed, but it's, it's something that is true of these games. They're the stories that you take away from this, the stories that you're gonna tell six months from now, uh, a year from now, 10 years from now, uh, those stories are important. Those stories are, are maybe one of the biggest reasons you come to the table, they're also one of the biggest things you take away from the table. And in addition to, I mean, these skills, which are, are absolutely spectacular and they help you become better, more confident, creative, and socially capable people just by sitting down and playing the game, but on top of that, you're also taking away these great stories. But when you have knowledge, when you have an understanding, uh, here's what these games give you, here's the, the amazing other ways that these games impact you, then you get an extra ability to be intentional about it, to be able to walk up to your game and think, this is how I want to approach my game, this is what I want to take away from, from my game the next time I sit down at the table. And that intentionality, that piece, that's what's going to help you be a better player what's gonna help you be a better GM, uh, what's ultimately gonna help you be a better person when you walk away from the table.